This talk was supposed to be entitled Addressing Progress Up the Mountain, and I don't know where the title went, but we lost it. And the reason it was called um, Addressing Progress Up the Mountain is because I spoke to one of the world's foremost mountaineers, Sir Christopher Bonington, when I was writing uh, One Can Make a Difference. And he told me a story about losing his boots on a climb up an ice face in the Alps and how he had to climb up in his cotton socks. And I thought, big deal, animal rights people do more than that every day. <laughs> so I thought we should start with looking back at how far up the mountain we've come, just some of the progress we've made in the last year. So here's the happy bit, the seal slaughter. We'd already managed to shut down the seal skin markets in Europe, in the US, and even China. But this year, the largest seal skin processing plant in Canada closed down. <laughs> Within weeks of our Angora rabbit video footage going on the web, basically every major retailer in the whole wide world agreed never to sell Angora again. You've all seen Zara. I mean, I get my clothes at thrift shop, as you can see, but if you've ever been in Zara, Zara not only stopped selling it, but they worked with us to take almost $1 million in Angora merchandise off the shelves and send it to Syrian refugee children. <laughs> SeaWorld, yes. We got C Southwest Airlines to stop painting orcas on their planes. We got AAA to stop promoting SeaWorld. The cutest of all is we got Mattel to stop selling SeaWorld Barbie. <laughs> what does it tell you when even a plastic doll doesn't want to be seen at SeaWorld? <laughs> And I hope nobody missed SeaWorld's new CEO's very first attempt at public relations when he asked that everybody tweet their thoughts to SeaWorld's website. <laughs> and they did. Here are some of my favorites. Do you fill your tanks with orca tears? Why is your parking lot bigger than the orca's tanks? If you were an orca, would you rather be in the ocean or one of your tanks? Do you really believe that Shamu Stadium is the most advanced marine habitat in the world? Have you ever seen the ocean? <laughs> Were you guys just drunk when you came up with this campaign? <laughs> and who hired your PR firm, and when are you getting a new one? <laughs> I want to show you our video rebuttal to SeaWorld's ad campaign. There are some facts about SeaWorld we'd like you to know. We used to steal orca babies from the wild, but now we masturbate them and breed mother orcas with their sons. Swimming in endless circles, attacking each other, and ramming their heads into concrete walls. Our whales are going insane. They're not doing well, and in fact, more than 30 have died. Our business is failing. But if you come to our parks, we'll tell you a bunch of lies. Why do we lie? Because if we told you the truth, you wouldn't come. And we think you're stupid. Really f***ing stupid. <laughs> have SeaWorld's budget, but it's doing really well on the internet. So, more happy. This year, Sao Paulo banned fur farms, Colorado banned greyhound racing, Orange New York requires animal abusers to register with the state, LA banned the bullhook, Miami banned the bullhook, Clatsop County, Oregon banned it too. San Francisco banned all acts with wild animals, so did Asheville, North Carolina just this week. In June, in June, Ontario banned the capture and breeding of marine mammals, and Mexico City banned animal circuses. Now we need Mexico to ban dolphinariums. So if you go to Cancun or one of these places, complain. We must be the squeaky wheels. Years ago, a newspaper sent me down to Florida to the opening of Disney's Wild Kingdom, and I remember two things. One is there was a man in a Goofy costume. I mean, as the character Goofy, who was signing autographs. And a woman next to me was really, really upset when Goofy went on break 
because she had promised her son that she would get a signed autograph from Goofy. And I thought, it's a man in a suit. I'll sign it for you. <laughs> anyway, the other thing I remember was that people were walking around with these giant turkey legs, and the fat was just dripping down their chins. It was quite revolting. Well, this year, Disney World Kingdom opened a vegan bakery. can be vegan, can't it? Ben and Jerry's promises to have vegan flavors soon. And no one can get away with saying, oh, but I can't give up cheese. They have Kite Hill. And I can't give up fish. They have Gardein. And I must have a fried egg. This is a vegan fried egg from Germany. And if you want vegan shark's fin soup or you want vegan sea slug, there's that too, as well as vegan caviar and vegan faux gras. Ten years ago, I was in a restaurant in France, not a bastion of veganism, and when I told the waitress that I was a vegan, she wrinkled her face up in that peculiar French way, <laughs> and she said, oh, bizarre. <laughs> I was just in France, and somebody took me to a lunch at the Athenae, where one of France's premier chefs, Alain Ducasse, has opened a restaurant where you can order a complete vegan lunch in Paris, $300, drinks not included. <laughs> That's progress. You know, it's an all strata of society. So everybody is going vegan. Supermodel Carla de Levin, de Levinia, de Levine, thank you, probably de Levine, told a reporter in something that I read that she depends on vegan chocolates to keep her going. She said, the other supermodels exist on just cigarettes and water. And I thought, oh, well, they're vegan too, aren't they? <laughs> Two more examples of victories. We found out that the largest pasta company in the world, Barilla, was testing on animals, and not like this. <laughs> we had a word with them, and they have just stopped all animal tests. <laughs> lately, lately, it's been a very bad time to own a roadside zoo. In the last year, Peter closed more bear pits like this one and rescued more bears, four more in the last week, monkeys and even chimpanzees from roadside zoos. And I'll show you one of the chimpanzees we rescued. In 2015, Peter was alerted to the plight of a 32-year-old chimpanzee named Iris. Iris was being held all alone in a tiny, barren, and dark cell at a roadside zoo called Chestity Wildlife Preserve and Zoo in Georgia. With virtually nothing to do or see and no companionship, Iris resorted to smearing her own feces on the walls of the cell, as highly distraught human prisoners have been known to do. And she spent much of her time huddled under a dirty blanket. But in March 2015, a generous PETA member helped us free Iris from this hellhole. Following negotiations, Iris was released from her prison and sent to the beautiful Save the Chimps Sanctuary in Florida. At Chestity, Iris had been pale and overweight, and her legs were underdeveloped, likely from a lack of opportunities to climb or exercise. But at the sanctuary, Iris is thriving. It usually takes months to prepare rescued chimpanzees to be introduced to others of their own kind, but gentle Iris was introduced to her next-door neighbor, Abdul, within days of arriving at the sanctuary. The two immediately greeted each other with hugs and kisses and groomed each other like old friends. Soon, Iris will be introduced to more chimpanzees and have the opportunity to live on a lush green island with palm trees and a chimpanzee family. Perhaps best of all, Iris will never be alone again. There is no shortage of cruelty in the world, and I won't torment you with the other kinds of videos 
Uh, they're all on the peter.org site. And I please, 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 please show them to everybody you know. Show them to others. They include everything from dog leather factories in China to laboratories like NIH, where baby monkeys are made into alcoholics and deliberately scared out of their wits by men wearing masks and mechanical snakes, to shearing sheds, where gentle, gentle sheep are punched and kicked in the face, their wounds stitched up with dental floss and no painkillers, to the stinking crocodile farms and the alligator pits, where these playful but despised mother animals a factory farmed only to have their children killed with a rod jammed up their spines so they can be turned into watch straps for men and ugly bags for the like of Kim Kardashian. But did you hear that just this week, this week, Jane Birkin, after whom the Birkin bag is named, watched the video that we took in Zimbabwe and the video we took of the alligator farms in Texas and asked Hermes, Take my name off the Birkin bag. There is no more Birkin bag. That upset the fashion industry so much that even Karl Lagerfeld, who is no friend of animals, his cat tweeted about it. So these exposés allow us to show a, a, or everybody, absolutely anybody, what's wrong so that they can't say, I had no idea. But the big picture, the big picture is even more vital, and that's advocating not just for this cruelty and that cruelty, which is all important, but for the overriding principle that animals are not ours to eat, to wear, to experiment on, to use for in entertainment or for any other purpose. They're not ours to use or abuse. that, especially on a talk show, some host will usually say, well, Ms. Newkirk, as happened when we were talking about Cecil on some shows this week, um, if you ruled the world, would it be against the law to eat a hamburger? Yes, yes, it would. <laughs> and spies can write that down. We're not survivalists. We don't need animals' body parts. To take them is cruel, it's supremacist, and it's racist. There is the human race, and there are all the other animal races, and nobody surely is in favor of racism. So not to be for animal rights is to be a racist. Speaking of spies from SeaWorld, from the circus, and the other ones that were mentioned from that frat boy outfit, CCF, if you spot any of them, please identify them to us, because we like to keep track of them for our own amusement and for our lawsuits. <laughs> Speaking of spies, someone with Homeland Security was on a radio show, and he said that years ago he had been asked to infiltrate Peter, so he started to come to our work parties. And he said he learned two surprising things. First, that Peter served Samuel Adams beer. And second, that he was allergic to mushrooms really badly. <laughs> so my message today is my message every day, all the time. And that's that we must never, ever, ever be silent. If we see something wrong, we must not cross the road. We must instead do everything that we can think of to stop the animal's unimaginable suffering. And I say unimaginable, which touches on something that Will was saying, because as much as we think we understand the suffering of animals, if we truly allowed ourselves to feel the enormity of it, and we must not, we would go insane. I was on a train in Scotland a couple of weeks ago, and people were all looking out of the window, and they were besotted by these lush green meadows with these beautiful white sheep on them, like little snowflakes all over the hill. And of course, the animal rights activist is looking out of the window and noticing that it's raining, and thinking, those sheep never get dry, do they? They have no shelter, no shade, they have nothing, and they're out there in winter, 
and they are freezing and they are coughing and their lambs are taken away. And they all get shorn in the ways that we've seen. Some will have their necks twisted until they're broken, others of them will be cut to shreds, all for a sweater or a pair of socks. There's a wonderful poem by somebody, and I can't remember it now, but it's all about the woolen this and the woolen that, and you're in your bed with the woolen blanket, and those sheep are out having been shorn. They don't have anything to keep them warm. And it makes you want to cry. But all that matters is that you act, is that we take all our sorrow and our anger and we use it to work. Yeah. And we work every day for animals. <laughs> how often and how much we say and do is what will determine how quickly we reach the time when people understand animal rights. It's that simple. For we are all exactly the same in the only ways that count, not in what we look like or the languages that we speak, but in that we feel pain and joy and love and grief and we desire freedom. If this eight ounce parrot can see and understand the interests of someone far larger and in a very different body, surely human beings can get it. There is a wonderful Peter Spork film. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. I'm a film junkie. It's called Win Wings of Desire. And in Wings of Desire, every human being is assigned a guardian angel who walks along beside them, sits where they sit, and so on, and is always looking out for them. And they are invisible. But we, all of us here, are the guardian angels of the animals. And we have to be highly visible and vocal. And we must be actively interfering with all those who would interfere with animals' lives and interests. Rescue isn't only finding a home for a dog or a cat. We rescue chickens when we ask our friends not to order the chicken salad sandwich. Can we tell them? Chickens are wonderful, feeling individuals. That's why I ask you, please, will you not eat the chicken salad sandwich? We rescue mice when we persuade people not to donate to the March of Dimes, which experiments on those little beings, but to give their money to Easter seals instead, which doesn't. There is always an alternative, a compassionate choice that can be made. We save tigers and elephants when we educate a family or some child as to why not to go to the animal circus. We have to do every single thing in word and deed and through social media and in every way so we can stop the normalization of the unthinkable. Because the normalization of the unthinkable is what has always allowed atrocities. I was going to show you a video, but I won't. It's, um, it's on this theme. There is the former SS guard, Oscar Gronig, who went on trial and was convicted this year. He referred to Auschwitz matter-of-factly as a processing plant. He said some 5,000 people were processed in 24 hours. When train two arrived, we had to wait until train one was entirely processed. The normalization of the unthinkable. And then there is Franz Stengel, who is a commandant at Treblinka. He said, when I was on a trip once, years later, in Brazil, my train stopped next to a slaughterhouse. The cattle in the pens, hearing the noise of the train, trotted up to the fence and stared at it. They were very close, one crowding the other, looking at me through that fence, and I thought, this reminds me of Poland. That's just how the people looked, trustingly, before they went into the tins. And Stangle's interviewer stopped him, and, he, and she said to him, you said tins. And Stangle said, well, yes, I couldn't eat tinned meat after that. Those big eyes which looked at me not knowing that in no time at all they'd be dead. 
You see, I rarely saw them as individuals. It was always a huge mass. How can I explain it, he said. They were naked, they were packed together, they were running, they were being driven with whips like... That was the system. It was just the system. You know that the Bronx Zoo, like most zoos, used to send expeditions overseas to collect specimens for their collections. And among those specimens, they came into possession of Otto Benga. You've probably heard of him, a tiny Congolese tribesman, a young man they brought back from Africa and exhibited in a chimpanzee cage. And they gave him a stool to sit on and they gave him an orangutan as a companion. That was 1904. But zoos in Europe were still exhibiting black people long after that, with people allowed to reach over the railings and pet and feed black children. Here's a human zoo poster from Germany in 1928. And if you think that was a million years ago, that was just 21 years before I was born. And it went on after that. People flocked to the Bronx Zoo to see Otto Benga. They gawked at him and they laughed at him just the way they do today in circuses and zoos, at other living beings. And when a delegation of black ministers went to see the New York mayor to plead Otto Benga's case and asked that the exhibit be closed, here's what the New York Times wrote. We don't understand all the emotion being expressed. Otto Benga is a normal specimen of his race, with a brain as much developed as those of the other members. Whether they are held to be illustrations of arrested development and really closer to the anthropoid apes than the other African savages, or whether they are viewed as the degenerate descendants of ordinary Negroes, they can be studied with profit. This is the New York Times opining that it was absurd to imagine that Otto Benga suffered or was humiliated as the black delegation claimed. So the New York Times upheld the normalization of the unthinkable. Twelve years after he was put on display, Otto Benga got hold of a gun and he shot himself and killed himself. I think the, the Sea World orcas who are ramming their heads into the tanks just can't get hold of a gun. Times change, but things and time only changes when enough people express their opinions that living beings should never ever be treated as amusements or slaves or what have you. And people used to say, but everybody does this. Or about slavery, they would say they were put here for us to use. Or for child labor, it makes things affordable. And on battered women, it's none of your business. Well, these are the words that we hear today. Everybody in this room has heard those words in another context. And we have to challenge them. And we have to point out that cruelty and injustice is certainly and always our business. In May, in May, Peter rescued 90 rabbits. Some had one ear, some had teeth overgrown into their mouths, some had infected sores on their feet, and they were kept in this place. And the man who lived there and admitted that for over a year he hadn't bothered to get out of his house to clean the cages would go out of his cat house sometimes because he didn't see them as individuals, but he saw them as a mass, and he would pick one up and break her neck and have her for dinner. And he would process her. And all I could think of in reading the investigator's report was that is the normalization of the unthinkable. Of course, just as men are not superior to women and whites aren't superior to any other pigmentation or lack of it, and so on, human beings are not superior to other beings. They are just different in the most unimportant ways, and sometimes really different in unimportant ways. I'll give you an example or two. I read a news story, and this is true. 
about a man who was blown out to sea on a pair of inflatable teeth. And he was rescued by a woman on an inflatable lobster. And I thought, mice don't do that. This is the difference. And then there was a woman, this is also true, she called into a radio show to complain about deer crossing signs. And she said she had had three accidents. And she said something had to be done about deer being allowed to cross busy streets. <laughs> and she suggested moving the deer crossing signs <laughs> so that deer would only cross in less congested areas. <laughs> Maybe where school children cross. At least she was being kind. So I like to collect human beings' odd, odd habits and how they're not really superior in any way. But I'm going to leave you with one more, and that's American Airlines had to make an emergency landing. This is true, because one of the passengers wouldn't stop singing, I will always love you. <laughs> anyway, when you look at a lizard or another animal, don't you see a person? Person isn't just a human being. The fins, the fur, the feathers, the covering, the build, the length of the nose, the number of the legs. It doesn't matter. There is a person in there with thoughts and feelings in every single body. There's a crow who visits my office uh, every morning. That isn't her. <laughs> my crow has only one foot. She has two legs, but she only has one foot. And I hear her, she caws around. I can hear her coming from a long way away because she has a very noisy child who was born last year. And there's something wrong with this child because the child just never shuts up. <laughs> but she lands on my, I call out to her. She lands on my windowsill and I feed her. And she loves blueberries. She hates falafel and I know that because she spat it out on some poor guy who was walking <laughs> underneath the window. And crows, you know, they're not necessarily very kind themselves. They, it's their nature to eat baby squirrels. So I trick her and I tell her I'm giving her a baby squirrel, but it's actually on Beyonce's vegan diet thing. <laughs> um, I give her a warm, soft bean burrito, which is like a baby squirrel, kind of. <laughs> and I see her peck into it and all this red stuff comes out and I'm sure she thinks I'm in the stomach now. And it's, you know, it's tomato sauce. I also tell her I'm giving her worms, but they're actually, it's, it's faux, it's spaghetti. <laughs> anyway, someone saw her eating, and I often think, one day I'm just going to nail shut the door to my office, open all the windows, and let the birds and the squirrels just have it. But someone came into my office, and they saw her eating, and they said, oh, she's so cute. And I thought, you know, that's what we do. We often just think animals are cute. No matter what they're doing, instead of reflecting on who they are and what their experience is in life. And we must do that because, after all, here's this crow with her one foot. She's somehow surviving in the concrete jungle. She has to fly and balance on electrical wires and the fire escape with her one foot. She has to deal with the mean traffic and the mean people, and she's scavenging to feed herself and her noisy child. In the winter, she arrives soaked to the skin and freezing cold, and I just wonder about her. If she injures that other foot, she's a goner. She's doing so many things that I am not at all sure I could do. I do not think I could survive out there the way she does. She is so impressive. She's a whole adult individual, yet we often infantilize animals. And even though they're stunningly clever, we giggle at them and we just think they're cute. It's a bit like calling a homeless refugee cute. So usually, whatever other animals do that's thoughtful and clever, we may ignore. I'm going to show you something. Take this cow who's figured out how to open gate slats with her tongue. I mean, it's just amazing. She's obviously studied it. She wasn't, you know, ignoring what the farmer was doing. She's figured it out. And she lets herself out. 
And here's a cow who's figured it all out that she has to go down the whole line to open these slats with her tongue so that she can get to this bucket and take it away. And this one has learned how to do a water pump with her horns. And she gets the water and then she'll, it stops coming out. And so she, has, she knows, she pulls it up and then with the other horn, she pulls it down. These individuals are demonstrating that they're thirsty, they're hungry, they're incredibly innovative. And I know it's cute when a dog tries to drag a swimming pool into the house without fingers, but he's working on a project because he wants the pool in the house, damn it. <laughs> It's all that that dog can do to communicate. He wants to go out and that he can't unless we open the damn door. And just as we tell dogs to be quiet when they bark, although we bark all the time and we have this little box we turn on that barks too, we store a cornucopia of food for ourselves whenever we want a snack and we take goodies out whenever we fancy. So why is it real cute rather than a telling moment when a dog goes to open the fridge himself. <coughs> takes work, takes study. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, why not? Why not? <laughs> not finished. See, you hide the best things in the back. <laughs> this goes on, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, I think we've got it. <laughs> and yes, it's cute, but it's much, much more when an octopus figures out how to use a discarded coconut shell as a shelter because she's being clever. This For her, it's survival. It uses discarded coconut shells to hide from potential threats. Small octopuses like these can transport shells for future use, too. They drape their bodies over the hollow of the shell. With their tentacles dangling over the edges, they can scuttle off with their hideout. This one has even worked out how to assemble a shelter from two half shells. It keeps a lookout through the gap between them. These are the first invertebrates that have been seen using tools. But they've been known to abandon their tools as well, as seen here when the camera gets a bit too close. <laughs> so animals are all working very, very hard to cope in a world where everything has been taken from them by the apex predators who are humans. And to promote animal rights, we have to get past cute to understanding and respect, although there are exceptions. <laughs> From my book, One Can Make a Difference, I interviewed the supermodel Petra Nemkova. 
In 2005, she was on holiday in Thailand when that massive tsunami hit. She was with her fiancé, and a wave came through the building and swept both of them out. Her fiancé disappeared, and days later he was found dead. Petra herself found her that she was being swept out to sea and that debris was smashing into her. She felt her pelvis shatter, she suffered other wounds, she knew she had internal injuries, but somehow she found herself wedged into a tree and the water receded, came back and receded, and she was in this tree. And she said that she could hear children screaming all around her and then silence as they were drowned. So the sea receded and left her stuck there for hours. She was unable to move and she said, what struck her was that she saw all around her there were fish and other sea creatures who were in the same condition that she was. Many of them were injured, they were gasping for breath, they were fighting for their lives, they had been taken out of their element. And she said this, if I could be granted one wish, it would be to, be, to convert me into we, to include all life forms in our consideration, not just some. And we, of course, don't have to be hit by a tsunami. Maybe coming into the animal rights movement is like being hit by a tsunami to realize this and to work hard to get others to realize it too. One last thing. The Bible says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you're an atheist, that still applies. Every one of us is so, so rich compared to all the other animals in this terribly cruel world. If we can pay for shelter, if we can put food in our mouths and clothes on our back, if we can entertain ourselves, if we can go to the doctor, if we feel sick, if we can decide that we are free, we can go here, we can go there, we can go jogging, we are so, so rich compared to the dog on the chain in the dirt patch 24-7, the elephant being hit with a bull hook in the animal circus and kept in shackles behind the big top when no one's looking, the hen inside the transport cage with her aching, broken wing that no one will ever pay any attention to. So that's why I think that we have an obligation, it's not charity, but an obligation to share our good wealth, our good fortune, our good everything. In India, many desperately poor people live on the streets. And sometimes their home is just a little scrap of cardboard, or sometimes they don't even have that. That's where they live. And one day I was in a taxi coming along a, a bridge in Gujarat and we stopped for some reason. And I looked over and there was a poor woman who was living on the bridge with her child and she had a little piece of cloth and that was about it. And as I was looking at her, she bent down and took out of the hem of her long skirt something couldn't figure out what it was. It was wrapped in a piece of paper. And then I saw along the bridge came this mother dog. And she obviously was in bad shape. And this woman had been looking out for her, poor as she was. And she put the little piece of paper down on the ground. She put the little rice ball that had been in the paper that she had saved on the piece of paper and she waited for the mother dog to come up and eat, and she guarded her until she had finished her supper. And I thought, you know, we throw away in a week more than that woman will ever see probably, in, or throw away in a day more than she'll see in a week. We just chuck out food without thinking. And I thought, if this woman, like that parrot that fed the dog, can remember what is wrong with us. We are so rich. If that woman could share, and this man on the street, who is also poor, could share his only blanket with a stray dog, 
we have to ask ourselves, how much more can we do? And we're wealthy in many other ways too. We have our freedom, our voice, our talents, we have our time, we have our energy. And if we share them, we will be far more powerful than all those high-paid lobbyists that are up on Capitol Hill. Far more popular, more powerful. If you're not yet vegan, please take a pledge right now to be one in what you wear, what you buy, what you eat, how you entertain yourself. And if you are vegan in all those ways, please pledge from this moment on to be an active, vocal human being who is determined to change everyone else. It can be done politely. We don't have to scream at everyone, although it's fun to do so sometimes. <laughs> but it must be done. And even the most timid of people can leave VSKs at the gym, can put things on social media. We can make a game of being active, a game of life and death, to seize ways to educate, to liberate. You can buy food for people, take people shopping, cook for them, unless you're like me and your dog turns his nose up at what you cook, in which case you can take them out. You can write letters to the editor, make blog comments, call into radio shows, do everything you can think of. We start by laying one brick and then another brick and eventually we have a whole animal rights house. Animals can't afford for us to hesitate, they can't afford for us to cross the road. As Thoreau said, you must live in the present, launch yourself on every wave, Find your eternity in every moment. Fools, he said, stand on their island of opportunities and look toward another land. There is no other land, there is no other life than this, and it goes by pretty quickly. We're all in this together, and we can all actively work for animal rights. My final thought is please remember this. Every single minute of your life is valuable to animals, so please don't allow even one minute of it to be wasted by those whose only role in our movement seems to attack other people in our movement. <laughs> simply, simply ignore negative and destructive people and let's work together or individually in every way because we are all vitally needed and please remember never ever be silent thank you very much <laughs>